actually got rental agreements in place for two separate locations. So on the day itself, we could decide which school we should our son go for. Renting a place to be within the one kilometer radius would be a shoe in For many parents, there's a lot leading up to primary school education. And it all boils down to getting their child in their school of choice. And that's nothing new. But I wonder if it's getting worse over the years and just how fair is the primary one registration process to all. Before I start my investigation, I want to know how parents feel about the primary one or P1 registration process. So I'm commissioning a survey. I'm deep diving into the details. Which schools are still top rated? Why parents pick the schools they do? how early they start planning, and how far they'll go to try to get into those schools. Before the latest round of changes to the P1 registration exercise, there were actually seven main categories to register your child in primary school. Phase one is for those with a sibling currently studying in that school. And apart from that, there are actually eight other ways a parent can get their first child into their primary school of choice under 2A1, 2A2 and 2B. Following that is phase 2C, which is the open to all category. Also, 2C supplementary for those who were unable to get in in earlier phases and phase 3, which is for international students. So as a parent, I found the whole process rather complex and actually, it's not just me. After three weeks, the results of my survey are in. Close to half of the 200 parents polled find the primary school registration process confusing. What's more interesting is that more than half say they are anxious that their child cannot get into their preferred school. Which might explain why 81% of parents engage in activities to increase their chances during the process. I want to meet the people behind this statistic. It took us a while to find someone willing to speak up, and not surprisingly, they'd rather remain anonymous. The Teo's first child was born in the Year of the Dragon. Their second is an SG-50 baby. The number of children competing for spots in primary school is higher than average for those years. So what was it like that first time going through the primary one registration process? Our research only started about 18 months before the P1 registration, like what are the phases, what documents you have to prepare. Being in that alumni phase, we thought that we would be quite comfortable. And then our son didn't get into the school. That's when our whole world basically collapsed. My whole family has been in this school. It's like a rite of passage for our boys. We had an appointment with the principal and I wrote to many people in MOE. The advice was, oh, um, you know, the next step is put him on the wait list. So we realised that um, we were really on our own. So we look at the next phase, which was going to be 2B, because 2B would be religion and some other associations. And renting a place to be within the one kilometre radius, so that it would be a shoe in But we were still contemplating between Catholic High and, and the other school. Yep. We actually got rental agreements in place for two separate locations. So on the day itself, we could decide which school should our son go for. When you had both those tenancy agreements, you hadn't moved into the place yet, right? So this is still legal? So it's a bit of a grey area. And as the personnel at MOE explained to us, if you need to change your address for whatever reason during your registration, there's nothing that they can do to stop you. I understand you have two children. I mean, so the second one literally just got her place a few weeks back. How different was the journey this time around? This time around, we looked at the numbers. Traditionally, my school is not as um, crazy popular as his school. We did contemplate having to move and to rent another place, but looking at the um, past figures and the population census, it's quite safe. Looking at all the things you've done, would you consider yourself extreme parents? We did think like, wow, we did so much. But actually when we went to talk to other people, we realised that we, we are not the only ones. <laughs> there are schools that are deemed better than others. 
So I feel that most parents, if they actually have the means, they would still choose to send their child to a good school. How much in total, money-wise, did you spend on this? Uh, I think we spent a little over 20 over 1,000. The rented apartment secured their son a place at their second choice of school in Phase 2B. But he eventually entered Catholic High School Primary after a student dropped out ahead of the school year. Their daughter got into Singapore Chinese Girls' School through Phase 2A. In total, the Teo spent over $20,000 to get both their children into their preferred schools. Most of the Teo's expenditure is actually spent on this. Housing. And housing, whether you buy or rent, well, we know it doesn't come cheap. But you know what? The Teo's are not alone in wanting a different postal code. 30% of all those we surveyed say they will still buy or rent a property close to the school of their preferred choice. Professor Sumin Agarwal is an economist who has spent about a decade researching real estate in Singapore. I want to find out if parents are driving up property prices near popular schools. How has the school affected property prices in this area? So that's a complicated question because, you know, the school itself will affect property prices, but there are many other things, amenities, okay. like an MRT station. This was a relocation of a school to this area. Ah. And that way we can isolate the effect of school itself. When the Raffles Girls School moved here, this affected property prices by as much as 14 to 15 percent. Here, property prices could range anywhere from 5 million to 15 million. Let's take a house that was around 8 or 9 million. Okay. That has essentially gone up almost by a million dollars. ACES Junior, which yep. moved also where the property prices went up 10 to 11 percent. What about neighborhood schools and HDB estates? You can't really say that the effect is big there. Okay, so it's more significant for what we deem, I guess, the so-called elite schools versus neighborhood schools. Exactly. These are the parents who are kiasu, they want the kid to be in the best primary school. They are trying to relocate and they are bidding up prices, either for the rental market or the purchasing market. Is this trend of parents driving up property prices even worse today? I'll venture a guess that this effect will become bigger, mainly because the competition by parents and the wealth level of their parents is going up. But why do parents choose the schools they do? And is there really intense competition across the same few popular schools today? Parents tend to be a little bit more strategic. Oh, remember this? Up to 2011, the Education Ministry used to name the top scoring PSLE students for each year. And parents would kind of use that as a gauge to decide which schools to send their kids to. But they've since taken that away. They felt it put an overemphasis on grades itself. But I wonder if that's really made any kind of a difference. These are some of the popular primary schools in the early 2000s. Ai Tong School, Catholic High School Primary, Nanyang Primary, Raffles Girls Primary and Rosehive School, just to name a few. And one thing these schools have in common, their students did well in their PSLE. To find out if the same few schools are popular today, I'm on my way to meet someone who has been analysing the P1 registration process for almost 15 years. Despite the um, MOE's um, attempts in trying to reduce mm -hmm. the, the focus on schools itself, right? I think over the last 10 years, for example, right, we see that the, the same schools keep appearing as the, the most popular schools. Right. Let me show you. Okay. Mr. Toh will take me through how competitive Phase 2C has been over the years. Phase 2C is the open category for children who did not get a spot in the earlier phases. Popular schools will have the least number of spots left. As you can see, right from in 2017, right, Nanyang Primary 
It's the only school with 26 places left over. But over the years, right, in 2021, I told all the way down to St. Theodore's right, has got 20 places left over. We have met schools marked in beige, right, the schools with at least 21 spaces. This shows that the demand is actually increasing over uh -huh. the years. Right. The funny thing is, right, over the last five years, the birth rate has actually dropped. Is it fair to assume that if MOE did not make a requirement for the minimum 20 spots, that some of these schools, especially the ones in blue, may not even have any schools. remaining spots available in this phase? We've been in trouble now. Yes. Right, right. This slide shows the situation after the phase 2C balloting. The topmost schools that went through balloting, for example, right, Northland Primary right, is 392% oversubscribed in 2017. And moving on, right, the percentage of uh, oversubscription is increasing. Northland Primary in 2021, 682% yes. oversubscribed. That's a lot. There's one in six chance of getting into the school. Of getting to the school, yes. <laughs> For Northland Primary, it's right in the middle of a housing estate, which is quite a lot of people. There's an interesting fact though, Northland Primary have actually had a top scorer more than 10 years ago. So there's a reason why I think Northland Primary is maintaining this kind of high ranking. MOE has stopped publishing PSL results. So most parents are dependent on hearsay. There's another school uh, that is not on the list, Tifa Primary. In 2009, right, there was a top scorer in PSLE. So over the years, CFA has moved from 50% subscription rate all the way to 120%. But we have no idea whether the school itself has actually been doing well. At least 80% of the schools here would have some top scorers. Parents will most likely choose a school which will give the children the highest chance of doing well. And doing well means academically? That is correct, yes. The intense competition has led to more children unable to get into a school near their home. So in September, the Education Ministry announced changes to the P1 registration process which will kick in in 2022. The aim is to make schools more accessible to all, but will it make a difference? The person I'm about to meet believes that the process of registering for primary school itself perpetuates educational inequalities. So what does it mean when we say that there's educational inequality? It really means the unequal distribution of academic resources mm -hmm. across schools. Singapore is doing well mm -hmm. in terms of making sure teachers are centrally deployed, so very little problem with you know, teacher quality. That every school has good infrastructure, adequate facilities. But on the other hand, that more popular schools, they would have you know, a stronger alumni. Mm -hmm. So they would be able to better support the students in terms of diverse activities and so on. There will be also differences in terms of like student populations, so mm -hmm. profile of students, the kind of social capital they bring with them. Right. So that in itself is quite important you know, in tipping the balance because it's also about who you hang out with in school. Ah. The kind of network, and some schools are more capable in attracting a certain profile right. of students. The way that our you know, registration system was organised, some of the phases really serve to benefit uh, families with resources. And what are the issues with the current registration framework? So this tray of candies, there are 200 of them, it represents the number of places in most schools at okay. the start of the right. registration process. Phase one is when students would have guaranteed admission because their siblings are in the school. Very popular schools will have more seats because parents, you know, they tend to be a little bit more strategic, uh, putting you know, their first child in a, in a popular school so that they don't have to worry about you know, f yep. future you know, enrollments. But at the same time, the current system also sets aside 20 places in each of phase 2B That's right. and 2C. I so then the remaining would be what we you see as you know phase 2A1 and 2A2. So these are the phases for not just alumni, but people who join the alumni association. So when we talk about phases 2A1 and 2A2, the most obvious uh, privilege would be what we call legacy benefits. Children having parents who have attended the school who are able to pay an alumni uh, association fee. There are also other uh, benefits in the other phases as well. So 2B, that is for parents who have served as a volunteer in the school, Active community leaders, you can imagine, you know, who, who are those people who will be able to volunteer? 
Okay, again, people with the resources who yes. can afford the time. And will these recent changes help even out the playing field? There is no longer a distinction between okay. whether or not you can pay mm. a registration fee to enter the, the uh, Alumni Association. So that is great because it also serves to make the originally very complicated system mm. less complicated. Mm. The latest change collapses phase 2A1 and 2A2 into one phase, 2A. There are now only six main categories in which a parent can register their child for primary school, down from the initial seven. So I guess overall that's a good thing, right? Because it makes the school accessible to more people. Well, the thing is, yeah. home school distance still feature in every stage, except okay. phase one. And what is also important is that, you know, in the new system, they add another 20 seats to phase 2C. Ah, seat. that's right. Yes. There were initially 20 seats each set aside in phase 2B and phase 2C at the start of P1 registration. There are now 20 more seats set aside in phase 2C. So you can see visually, you are really distributing more seats to 2C from this original pile. Right. Uh, so there might be a squeeze over here, there are more seats at phase 2C. Parents or families who were initially inhibited because they were calculating their chances okay. suddenly find that, hey, let's give it a shot, why not? That's right. Parents with the means to buy a home within one kilometre would want to buy an additional layer of insurance. So even right. if they apply, they could apply for Phase 2A. If they don't get it, they will try to see. So it seems the latest round of changes will not make much of a difference. Sure, the registration framework is a little bit less complicated, but that's going to just drive competition elsewhere. Because at the end of the day, where you live is still the biggest determining factor impacting your chances. Is there any way we can make the system fairer for all? What you suggested is pretty radical. Of the over 200 parents that we poll, views are pretty much split down the middle when asked if every school is a good school. I've learned that parents do prefer certain schools. Some make their choices based on a school's perceived academic prowess, others on a school's programs and values. But it's always the same few schools that are hotly contested during the primary one or P1 registration process. Short of relocating popular schools, I want to know if there is any way to make the system fairer. The person I'm meeting believes there might be a solution. What I have here is the latest framework for Primary 1 registration. How do you think it can be further improved so that it's more fair? Well, fair means that everyone gets a more level playing field. Okay. Um, there's less time and energy spent strategizing by parents. This first criterion, child who has a sibling studying in the school, mm. the children are young and it's a good thing in terms of parental logistics. Okay, so you're yes. saying we should keep this, this makes sense? Ah, uh, yes. We move on to phase 2A, the alumni. That's inherited privilege, isn't it? Let's yeah. take away 2A. So probably we ought to remove this. Okay. A parent who's a member of the school advisory and management committee. Mm. Once again, it's parental privilege. Child whose parent is a staff member of the school, some might argue it's similar to having a sibling studying in the school. Mm. It's convenient for this particular group of parents. If you think of this as a kind of employment perk, we should say no to this too. Okay. This criterion doesn't privilege any particular group of parents and we have to remember that these MOE kindergartens are affiliated to non-elite primary schools. So that's 2A, pretty much wiped out. What about 2B? child whose parent is a volunteer at the school. Not every parent has the time or the resources to be a volunteer. And then membership in a church or clan that's affiliated with the school. This criterion only affects a small minority of schools right. in Singapore. So one might say we are looking for criteria that are consistent across all of our primary schools. And then we have community leadership. Right. The entire primary school registration exercise is trying to accomplish too many competing objectives at the okay. same time. The building of ties with alumni, the 
church or clan, employment perks for parents who work in the school, benefits for parents who volunteer in the school, okay. and then we also have community leadership. So if we look at it, everybody will end up competing at this phase. That's right, and that would probably be much fairer in terms of opening up access considerably compared to the what we had here on the board earlier on. So the one to two kilometer radius of a school becomes the competing factor. I think we need to rethink this whole issue of proximity. Okay. Um, I'll show you. Yeah. I have a map of Singapore here. One of the key issues we have is that some of the more popular primary schools aren't exactly distributed evenly mm. across Singapore. For example, some of the schools in this area here. In Bukit Timah, yeah. That's right. And it's an area that is dominated by upper class housing. Right. So why don't we think beyond the confines of one or two kilometres and say, draw a wider net? Oh. And say, in the case of this cluster here. Okay. Uh, and maybe the, another cluster here. But actually, with what you're suggesting, it actually goes against the idea of going to a school in your neighbourhood. Not every parent out there is yeah. dead set on getting their child into a branded primary school, and that's perfectly okay. This is to provide a greater chance of access. What you suggested is a pretty radical idea, and I can already hear parents going, no way, that's just a crazy idea. I mean, what would you say to them? Ah, but Steve, we're not trying to make everyone happy. You'll never quite be able to have a system that doesn't privilege a particular group of parents. But there's always, I guess, that tricky business of weighing up pros and cons. I don't think any country in the world has gotten it right. I've learned that competition for choice primary schools is getting more intense over the years and even after the latest round of changes, the P1 registration process still ultimately favours those with the resources. So if you can put in the time, the effort and have the money to invest in the system, you stand a better chance of getting your child into the school of your choice. Perhaps it's time to make some radical changes to the primary one registration process to level the playing field even more.